Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Paul has been talking about relationships, you know, how he treat mothers, how we treat in the last chapter, how you treat widows, allow on widows, how the, how to treat the elders in the church. Um, you know, respecting them and you know, you just don't get it, you don't get a pass on respecting elders. Just because you don't like, if you may not like them, you may not like how they do something. They don't give you a pass to disobey the word of God. I don't care who you are. And so uh, that's just the way it is. Amen? Hallelujah. Unless they're out in sin, then, then the pastor's supposed to deal with that. All right? Glory to God. Now he moves on to a, a different arena here, still de- dealing with relationships. So let's look at the first three verses. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor that, name, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. And uh, really, he gets into verse 3, it kind of starts moving into a different direction. Let's talk about this. Um, we're talking about the... the uh, relationships in the church, but he adds something here, masters and slaves. Okay? And you understand, during the Roman Empire, there was slavery. Uh, under, and even in Judaism, there was slavery. People sold themselves as indentured slaves. Oftentimes, people would uh, not handle their, their finances right and would sell themselves as a slave or a servant um, in order to um, keep from going bankrupt and not have being destitute. <coughs> and so verse 1 tells us here, it says, let as many mass, uh, servants as are under the yoke. It reflects the attitude of a non-Christian master. You're under the yoke, you're dealing with a non-Christian master, all right? And here, the, um, he says here, uh, they, they regarded, then listen, these non-Christians regarded slaves in the same way they did cattle. They were owned by them, all right? They were just, they were just a, a, a property asset, all right? Um, if the Christian considered himself an heir of salvation and his master as a son of perdition, a feeling of pious superiority on the part of the slave could result. In other words, Paul is saying, listen, yeah, you're under the yoke. You're a slave. This is a culture we live in. All right? Do not change because you got saved. Do not start treating the master with disrespect or whatever just because you got saved and he's not. Okay, you know, he's, he's warning here uh, not to do that. Why? Because he says what? Um, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. In other words, you're born again. You're supposed to be demonstrating the love of God. Yeah, you're in a cultural mess. We all know that slavery is evil. It's an evil system. But it's been, it has been in humanity for millennia. Not just in America, it's been in Africa, it's been in Europe, it's been all over the world. We've had to deal with slavery. Because men, are, men create evil systems. They, they will. They will create an evil system. But he said to these new, to this new, these new believers, don't um, dishonor. Okay? Really count your own mouth as worth of all honor. Don't dishonor your master because you're now a believer. All right, because by that blasphemes the name of God and His doctrine. In other words, what walking in love, being the best person you're supposed to be, demonstrated by your actions and attitude that you had an encounter with Jesus Christ. Okay, and uh, they that have believing masters. So he's now talking about a different set of masters. Let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit. This teach, these teach and exhort. So now Paul comes down and says, listen, if your master is a believer. Then, then do right. Now, what? Why? People say, well, why didn't Paul just write and say, all right, let's do away with slavery? Because it, it, you, can't, you couldn't do something by overthrow that was going to take a working of God to accomplish. And you see, you could, if, you had, if you had all the, the, the slaves start uprising and rebelling at that point in time, you're going to have a mess. You're going to have a cultural mess. So what he's saying is, let's walk this out. It's going to take some time. Uh, let's do it in the love of God. And then as people's hearts are changed, the system's going to change. You know, when they, when they wrote our Constitution for the United States, one of the things that, that was the sticky point for finalizing the Constitution was slavery. They, they knew, and, and so when they brought the states together, you had the slave states, the non-slave states. There was an issue there. They knew they could not sign that Constitution if they did not come up with a way to deal with that. And what they did was they came up with the amendment, the process called the amendment process. They knew in time 
that men's hearts would change and that through the amendment process, they would be able to do away with slavery in America. And it ended up being a civil war, but still the amendment process in the Constitution is what finalized it, you know, and gave, gave slaves full voting rights, gave them full citizenship rights and so forth. They knew at the time they couldn't fix it. Paul knows at the time here in this culture, in this setting, he can't fix this. He can't say just, okay, I, I command everybody to turn all your slaves loose and all the slaves, you know, it, they could have. But they would have had a cultural mess um, with the Roman Empire, with, the, with the, the leaders in Judaism. They would have just had a mess. And so what they say, let's walk in love. Let's serve in love. You know, Paul writes in another place about masters and slaves. He tells the masters not to be overbearing, the Christian masters not to be overbearing, okay? And, and the ones not do eye service. So, so he was trying to come up with a, a way of, in that setting at that time, this is not forever, this was at that setting at that time, to give it time that as the body matured and the body grew and Christianity spread, that things would change because men's hearts were changed. And then they wouldn't have a cultural crisis. It would be, it would be a godly thing, you know, and uh, without a civil war. Because, you, you know, a lot of people died in the civil war. Um, probably, I don't know, half a million or something? I mean, half a billion? No, 500,000, some, some crazy number for that era, for that time. So uh, Paul's trying to deal with a cultural problem in getting people to walk in love one towards another, and then in time, through the maturing, things will be rectified and taken care of. That's, that's what he's setting forth here. Not that he was for slavery. This was not pro-slavery. This was not, you know, well, you know, we're just gonna keep, we, we just want to keep things the way they are. No, he understood the, the, the setting he was working in, and he had to work with it in time. It was going to be a time thing. And over time, as men's hearts were changed and transformed, then the other things would take place. They would fall into place. It's just like, um, you know, some of the things about women in the church were, were part of the cultural thing they had to deal with at the time. And, you know, you've got to give it time for the things to change because the culture was so male-dominant, almost anti-woman, it was going to take time for that to change. You just couldn't say, all right, let the women take over and run the church. You know, you guys are wrong. You'd have a problem. So some of the cultural issues had to be dealt with with the understanding that in time, as people came to know who they were in Christ, as they began to mature in Christ, as they began to grow up in Christ, they understand that in Christ Jesus, there's neither male nor female. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. As they began to understand the spiritual application, they became over into the natural application, things would change culturally. Amen. America... Um, somebody, somebody turn the air conditioner on a little bit just so it comes on as on air, not heat. It's a little stuffy in here. Crazy weather we're in. The next week's going to be in the 20s at night. Aren't you excited? Melanie, we're glad y'all back. Did y'all have fun? Yeah, all right. Hallelujah. Um, people go around the world to different, to different nations and different cultures, and women are dogs. D- d- listen, let me tell you something. I, I have friends who are missionaries and been missionaries in, in Africa. And you women that are in America, you better be thanking God you're in America. Because they treat their women like dogs. The man sits at home on his duff and the woman goes out and walks five miles each way to get water to bring back. While he sits home as the king with his little harem. Hello. And they serve him like he's a god. You know. Now I know what happened here in America. Somebody be cut. Hey, Miss Geraldine, she, you know, Calica, she can put out her hawk knife and cut somebody, you know. But see, and, you know, thank God, you know, but in that culture, man, you, you got to, it takes time to, to change things. I mean, you know, preachers go over there and get somebody saved, and the king showed up with eight wives. They all got saved. Well, it's going to take some time to get into the culture of one wife with one man. He can't divorce seven of them. Which ones does he get rid of? You know, so some things culturally take time to address as they begin to walk in, the, in, in understanding and walk in the word, and as cultures change, and America's culture, um, now since we've gone overboard in some sense, we've gone way overboard in some senses, uh, the third wave of feminism, uh, it's, it's lunacy. You know, it's all about anti-man now, anti, you know, all, uh, about bringing man down and making him more feminine, less masculine, and women more masculine and less feminine, you know, and that, all that's crazy stuff. Um, that's just of the devil. All right. Let's move on to verse 3 since we, we had such fun with that one. Okay. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Um, 
He is proud, knowing nothing, but dotting about questions and strifes of words, whereof come, comes envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness uh, from such withdrawal. Let's stop here. And let's go through um, verse 3 through 5. And we begin a new section. We move out of the relationship thing, and we move into warnings. Paul begins some warnings. Remember, he's kind of concluding this letter. And uh, there are false teachers who did not, what, consent to wholesome words. The word consent means approach with a derived sense of attaching oneself to. People come in with words. They want to attach you to their words and draw you away from the truth. There, listen, I do not know how to put this in any other words. There are evil people who are designed to cause a problem for you and to mess you up. Amen? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Can you say amen? They are designed. They design themselves to mess up your life, to draw you away unto them. They've got doctrines. And listen, a lot of times it's all because they want to get into some money. They're, they're trying to make some money off of stuff. And they, they'll just, you know, they'll, they'll take the body of Christ for a ride because we can be so stupid sometimes. And let me say this. The charismatic word of faith people can be the most gullible people I've ever met in my life. And I've been in a bunch for 30 years. Somebody comes along with a heavy revy, and you feel goosebumps when you hear it preached. And it's got to be God because you've got chills up and down your spine. I mean, you feel like John Travolta. I got chills, they're multiplying. The next words are, and I'm losing control. Yeah, and that's exactly how people do. They lose control doctrinally. And they get themselves into a mess, all right? So, we, we are, to, you know, he says, if any man teaches otherwise and consents not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Oh my, we need to, we need to have doctrines that are, that are according to godliness, don't we? Amen. Hallelujah. So, praise the Lord. He is proud, knowing nothing, but dotting about questions. Um, actually, the word dotting about can, can actually be translated uh, mentally sick. I've seen some loony bins out there. Hello. You've heard them. You've been around them. I mean, I've been around people. When you talk to them, you feel like you're in jungle, but with Ka going, trust in me. His eyes swirling in your, you're like Mowgli. How many of you seen Jungle Book, the cartoon? you never seen Jungle Book? She's never seen Jungle Book. Have you got Jungle Book at home? Oh, okay. So you need to show it to her. <laughs> well, where about, nodding about questions and strifes of words. What? Whereof cometh. In other words, these people who do not provide the wholesome doctrine, don't, don't, don't submit to the doctrine of Christ, who teach other things, who can even almost in a sense be mentally sick, and they're bringing about questions and strifes. What happened? They stir up envy. They stir up strife. They stir up railings. They stir up evil surmising. They're perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds. And they'll come and say they're of God. I'm an apostle. I'm apostle, prophet, bishop of the third order of the highest order of Christians in the world. I mean, they got some kind of crazy title. Hello. Wear some kind of golden cherub robe, you know, that looks like they're, you know, they're a priest from the, the Jewish priest order or something. Then they get all, get all weirded out and people just follow after them and act crazy. Supposing that gain is godliness. Now, very interesting thing here on this. Uh, most comment, uh, one of the commentaries from Donald Guthrie says this. Um, it, so it should be supposing that godliness is a way of gain. In Moffat's translation says, they imagine religion is a paying concern. In other words, they're trying to figure out how to make money off of it. Now, I th we, we have got to get back to being watchful. My brother Hagen, he had, he had a, a sermon, and, and he, he used to teach ministers. And he would say this, there are the three, G's, the three G's in ministry you need to watch out. Watch out for the girls, watch out for the glory, and watch out for the gold. The gold, the glory, and the girls. Those are the three traps ministers will fail in if they're not careful. Now, what's the gold represent? It represents the money. You get, you, you get greedy for filth. You get out of line with the word of God. You get all concerned about making money. Girls, I mean, that don't think you'll come up to you and you'll be 60, 70, 80 years old, look like, I mean, you look like you need to uh, be a walking cane, you know, a poster child for the local um, uh, 
convalescent home and some hot babe comes up wanting to uh, go out with you. Stupid. She's after the money you think she thinks she's going to get when you kick over. And she figures you're going to kick over pretty soon. Hello. And then the glory. We don't take any glory for ourselves. Oh, I lay, uh, Brother Hagin said one time, people, he said, people, I, we'd have healing services and people go out and lie on me. Yeah, they'd lie on me. They said, that Hagin fellow would heal somebody last night. He said, I can't heal anybody. Amen? There's a healing anointing on his life, but that comes from the Lord. That ministry and the, and, and the glory goes to the Lord. It doesn't go to the man. <clears throat> but some people get so caught up with all this, they start, th they start thinking they're something. Without the anointing, you're nothing. Without his power, you're nothing. Without the, without the glory of God, you're nothing. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. You can't take the glory. So you watch out for the gold, watch out for the glory, and watch out for the girls. All three of them will sink your ship. In combination, all by themselves. Hello. Thank you for your enthusiasm. So here we have these people who come in who suppose that, um, that the um, religion is a paying concern. In other words, that they can milk the people. And you see it all the time. How many of you ever watch these programs at night? You know, used to years ago. Real estate. I have this 12 tape. It was, all, it was, on, it was on cassettes. This 12 tape series on uh, how to take real estate and make millions and millions of dollars. And it's $400. And people are lighting up the telephone lines and buying this, these 12 tapes at $400 a, 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 a set. Well, you get 1000 well, good gracious, that's, four, that's, that's $400,000. They're going to get off of selling you what they know about. They're not doing it anymore. They're just telling you how to do it, and they're making, getting rich off of it. it. Selling real estate, or the concept of selling real estate, has now become a gain to them. They're not even doing the stuff what they're talking about anymore. They're selling it to you. Hello. See, and then you get Christians. You know, and I, like, I don't understand supporting ministries and stuff. We, we've gotten a little crazy sometimes. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to, I know situation, one time I, I was in a, in a meeting one, one place, and this guy was going to teach, and I want I to discuss, I don't want to discuss the actual concept he's talking about, but there was a concept he had that would supposedly help churches. And he was going to come in, and he was going to sell that concept to the churches. In other words, every church that would join with him, they paid him so much per member in the church for him to teach them how to make it bigger and how to do this. Well, you get enough churches behind you, and you're just making a bunch of money. Now, wait a second. What, whatever happened to sharing the gospel? If God wants to, you know, and then, then people rewarding that out of their hearts. You know, you're going to charge me X number. Of, uh, so I had to pay you X number of dollars a month for you to tell me how to grow my church. Well, thank you. I got a free one called the Holy Ghost. And I don't believe God gave you that plan to do it that way. Sorry. Of course, they had a max out. If you got to 1,000 people, then they did go over $1,000 per church. Wow. That's ingracious. It wouldn't take 10 or 15 of those kind of churches, and, and you've you got a nice salary coming in. Hello? Whatever happened to just, you know, Paul would, would <laughs> sew his own nets and, and, and make tents, and to make tents just to be able to preach the gospel. Okay, so the religion is for gain, um, you know, here. So really it says here that, that um, godliness is gain is really kind of a backwards way of saying it. It didn't come out correct. It didn't really come out in the King James, supposing that godliness is a way of gain. Um, they suppose, you know, instead of, uh, how did, how did the King, that gain is godliness. Supposing that gain is godliness kind of comes out weird in the King James. It means that supposing that godliness is for gain or a way of gain or religion is a way to make money. Okay, Paul doesn't stop there. He goes on a little bit more. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, we love, now the anti-prosperity people love this verse. But see, they need to do the same thing that the prosperity people need to do is read your Bible better. Okay? This phrase um, that says, Supposing, or, but godliness with great gain is, is, is with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into this world. We can't carry anything out. Verse seven. Okay. Um, this this word contentment 
is an inward sufficiency. Much like Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, it says, you know, I've learned to be abased and not lose my poise, learned to, uh, be, to abound and not lose my head. I can do all things, you know, um, I'm independent of the circumstances. Amen? You know, therein to be content. He says, I've learned to be independent of the circumstances. The same words and the same phraseology is here in this, with contentment and content. It is the inward sufficiency not being tied to the outward so he is content from the inward understanding that, that, that circumstances do not affect who we are and how we function. Okay? Um, so he, sa- um, he says here, God this with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into this world. We can't carry anything out. And who knows that? The material things of this world are not what we pursue after. Now let me say something. One of the problems we ran into in the prosperity message is people got all caught up with making money. And they would hide it. Oh, I'm going to get rich so I can bless the kingdom. Yeah, and you're going to have the house in the mountains. You're going to have the $400,000 car. You're going to have uh, your own private airplane. You're going to have your own uh, charter ship. You might show up at church once every seven years. Now, we all know you say in the other side, I'm going to bless the church, and you think in the other. That's why a lot of people didn't get anything, because their brain was functioning, and, and, and their heart and what they were saying were not connected. They weren't saying the same thing. Okay? God wants you to prosper. I believe that with all my heart. I believe God wants you to walk in his blessings. I believe believe that the best blessing of Abraham, he wants it to come on his people. But let me say this. If you don't have the heart of Abraham, you don't get the blessing of Abraham. Hello. That went over big. Thank you. Okay. And so he goes on and says this, and having food and raiment, let us there be content. Um, now, food meaning nourishment or sustenance. And actually, this word implies a full supply of every day. And then raiment, it means coverings. And it includes both covering and shelter. So Paul was certainly aware, he was repeating what Jesus said, <clears throat> be there with content. In other words, again, independent of the other things, you're covered, you're clothed, you're fed. Be at peace. Don't be in crazy pursuit of getting rich. Okay? And the word content here, now this is, this is from Greek scholars, okay, uh, is in the future indicative tense, and it is not so much an exhortation to be content or to be satisfied where you are, but an assertion that this is the path to real contentment. In other words, when you learn that you have food, you have clothing, and you have shelter, and you're no longer tied to the external for joy and for walking with the Lord and for being at peace. This is the path to contentment. That's what it means. It does, it's not a demand, well, since you got that, just put up with, with it not having enough or whatever. No. He's saying you're, you're going to be supplied. You're going to be covered. You're going to be clothed. That is your path. When you learn that that is sufficient for you to be joyful and happy and walk with the Lord and be blessed and not be uptight and not be crazy and not lose all control, when you get there, you're on the path to contentment. That's what the the Greek bears. That's what the Greek carries out in here. Okay? Listen. But they that will be rich... Fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. What does it mean we'll be rich? When you just get your mind on getting rich. That's all you can think about. Getting rich. I'm going to get rich. I'm going to get rich. I'm not going to have to work anymore. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to get rich. I've heard people say, I'm going to get the 100. I'm going to live on the 90 and give the 10. If you can't give the 20 now or you can't give the 30 now, you ain't ever going to get to the 90. Hello? We have to, we really have to keep it and understand that wherever we are, we've got to be on that path to contentment. We have to be settled that the circumstances don't govern us. The circumstances don't control us. The things around us aren't, they are transient and they are changing. We're walking with the Lord. Can you say amen? Okay. Then he goes on here with the next one. Well, listen to this. The person who will be rich. People, I preach prosperity. I preach the blessing of Abraham. I preach that tithing causes return. I preach that giving causes return. I preach that God wants to make you rich to establish his covenant in the earth. But let me tell you this. If your heart is not right, you're going to get yourself in trouble. 
If you don't keep your heart right towards money and towards prosperity and, a toward, and, and you're just pursuing getting rich, you give because you're going to get, not because you love the Lord. If you give to get rich and not because you love the Lord, you're giving for the wrong reason. Say, ouch, amen, help me, or turn me off. I don't care, but that's the truth. If you do not give because you love God, you love his word, you're in obedience to God, and you're doing it, you would do it whether you got a penny back or not. If you would not give, if you didn't get a return, then you will never know what the, the blessing of the Lord. What you are, you're, you're, you're trying to be rich. If you go to a meeting and they tell you that if you'll give to the preacher tonight because there's a special anointing on him, you're going to a thousand-fold return. And the only reason you're getting giving is so you get a thousand-fold return. You, you, can, you can lie to yourself and you can lie to your hound dog laying on the front porch on a hot summer afternoon. But you know in your heart of hearts the only reason you gave in that offering and the only reason you gave that night it was, was the promise you're going to get rich overnight. It wasn't because you wanted to give and bless the kingdom. And preachers, stop lying to people. Stop telling them they give up to a higher anointing, they're going to be rich next week. They're going to get a thousand-fold return and some crazy mess like that because they gave up to the higher anointing. People, I'd rather you go out and give to the poor because what? He that gives to the poor lends to the Lord and he will repay. Amen. Then going and running out to some meeting somewhere where somebody's going to get all the money shoved down their coat pocket and they're going to walk out and talk about how, how if you give to the higher anointing you're going to get blessed. I just don't believe the Bible bears that out. The labor is worthy of his hire. If he's, you know, I want to know if you'd get that same amount of money if he was telling you to go sell all you got, give to the poor and come follow Jesus. Would you give that money that night? Or you only gave because you got the promise you're going to get rich and get you a five-car garage house and a $2 million house and you're going to have a Lamborghini and you're going to have your own private this and private that. If you're only giving because you're, you're following the image of wealth. Folks, multi-level marketing guys do that stuff all the time. They got people buying products just so they can, because they got the illusion that one day they're going to be in the upper tier of that multi-level marketing company and they're going to have this and they're going to have that. The only reason they're buying the product ain't because it's the best product on the market. They're buying the product because they're trying to get rich. And there's a lot of ministers who are basically using multi-level marketing techniques, giving, selling them the product. If you buy the product, then you're going to get rich. And you keep buying the product long enough, you're going to get rich. And they're not doing it because they love the kingdom. Again, I preach prosperity. I preach the Abraham blessing. I preach tithing in return. I preach uh, giving in return. I preach all that, and I believe all that. But I also believe that if we don't teach the other side, that if your heart is not right, it won't work. It has to come first. The right heart, the right attitude must be first if you want anything to work for you in your life. If you won't buy the series on how to humble yourself before the Lord, but you'll buy 25 on how to get rich quick overnight by giving to the higher anointing. There's something wrong. Thank you. He says here that they that will be rich. In other words, that, you know, this is really saying that they're pursuing getting rich. They're not coming to a church service. The pastor's preaching on biblical prosperity and biblical uh, how to handle you about your finances biblically according to the word of God and God doing what he said back in return. And you're not, but you're not doing it for that reason. You're not tithing because you're going, the heaven's windows are going to be open until you're tithing because God said to tithe. Amen? He says here, they fall into temptation and a snare to many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Let me say, there's a lot of people, they got the money that they're after, they would never see them in church again. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which some have coveted after. They have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Let me back up here. I had never studied this out before. Uh, the love of money is the root of all evil. I just always quoted that because you know, I read it out of the King James, and that's what it said. The love of money is the, the root of all evil. After study, 
Why did I just never did? It was, it was, it was there. It was, you know, I, was like, I thought it was pretty plain. The, really, the Greek bears out more of this. The love of money is a root of all evil. In other words, all evil, any kind of evil can spring from, from the root of the love of money. In other words, the love of money is not the only thing that causes evil. There are religious zealots that have nothing, that have nothing to do with money. They're evil. So I had, to, I had to come back go back and kind of look at this, and I studied it, looked at a bunch of other translations, and they all, I'm telling you, by far say the love of money is a root of all evil or that any evil can spring forth from. Okay, so that means, you know, people cutting people's heads off because they, won't, they didn't convert to uh, Islam or, you know, radi uh, radical or Muslim or whatever. That wasn't because of money. They, they were doing it because they're just full of the devil. Hello? Some man runs off with another woman doesn't mean he did it for the money. He did it for the, he did it for the sex. Okay, so. He, Paul, in this context, is talking about piercing yourself through with sorrows. Paul's talking about people being pursuing richness with the wrong attitudes and stuff. And he, then he comes back and says this, for the love of money is a root from which any kind of evil can spring from. Okay? People will sell all kinds of things. They'll sell their bodies. They'll sell, their, they'll, they'll sell drugs. They'll cheat. They'll lie. They'll steal. They'll embezzle. Why? To get money. So all kinds of evil come from the love of money. But it is not the only thing from which evil springs from. So I had to, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been corrected. Because I've said for years, everything you know, always goes back to the money. Well, it doesn't always go back to the money. Some things go back to religious zealousy. Okay? Some things go back to just pure physical pleasures. I mean, they just, nothing with money at all. Some things go to other, but they're all evils. The love of money is a root from which evil springs. How many of you have ever had a tree spring? And I've got a cherry tree in my backyard. I've got to cut it down. It's gotten too close to the house. But I planted, I planted it when we first moved in. And after about three or four years, it got to, not, not real big, but it died. So I, chopped, I just zipped it off at the ground. Next year, it came back, came back in different places. It is huge now. It's got about a 70-foot span from furthest limb to furthest limb. Okay? Too close to the house, the roots are starting to run into the I've got to cut it. All right, but I'll get things coming up out of the different roots. You know, the, the, uh, another try to come. I got to cut it off because I don't need another tree growing there. See, and the love of money is like one of those roots, and, and e all kinds of evil can pop up out of there. Okay, you know, drug dealers. You know, the mafia, um, our unions now. Uh, the, a lot of those things are just the, the love of money governs that. People vote for certain politicians only for one reason, the love of money, not because they, they believe in what they're doing. They want, they want their payback. Okay? So, the love of money is, the root of all, or is a root of all evil, which while some coveted after, what, the love of money, they have erred from the faith. They got pursuing the money and missed out on God and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You'll get yourself in trouble pursuing money. Let's pursue Jesus. Amen? But thou, O man of God, flee these things, follow, but, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Righteousness is doing right. In this particular context, it means doing right towards other people in God. Do right towards God, do right towards other men. A godliness meaning living right. We're to live right. Faith, love, patience, faith, love is agape, but it means love towards other people, how you treat and how you walk in love towards other people, patience and meekness. Then he goes on and says this, fight the good fight of faith. Whereunto thou art also called. We are all called to do what? Fight the good fight of faith. And has professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickens or makes alive all things, and before Christ Jesus, who, Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable. There, there's, uh, with the, unto the appearing of our Lord, there's uh, speculation. He was talking about the, whatever was, late, was charged to Timothy when he was ordained into the ministry. Keep that commandment. Follow after God. Which at his time, at, in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Charge them that are rich in this world, that they not be high-minded. Don't get cocky. Listen, just because you've got money don't mean you can run everything. Now, how many times that happened in church? Some daddy money bucks walks in, they got a lot of money, and they think they get to run everything because they're used to running everything because they got money. 
Paul says, don't be high-minded. Okay? Don't tr and he says, nor trust. He tells them, don't trust in uncertain riches. What? But in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. In other words, don't you put your trust in your money. It can be gone tomorrow. Why do you think people jumped out of windows when the stock market fell in the 20s? And when, and when we had the, the, cra the, uh, the crash uh, back in the, the early 90s, the dot-com bu dot bubble crash. Why do you think people killed themselves and jumped out windows and hung themselves? Because they trusted in the uncertain riches. Okay? But here's what they're supposed to do. They do good works, that they should be rich in, and they should do good. They should be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. Now, we're talking about communicate don't mean talk. Here it means to communicate financially and, and bless people financially. Help them. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. So in other words, he gave them one charge, last charge to the rich people. He's taught the people who don't have money, don't, don't be crazy about going and getting rich. I am telling you, I know this for a fact. You could have a meeting here in town. You could have two churches a mile apart. You could have a prosperity seminar, how to get rich and, you know, and live, live in abundance. And you could have a how to reach the lost seminar. And I can guarantee you there'd be three to one over in the prosperity, if not more. Now, a number of years ago, we had a, we had a, a pastor here. After, and it's been so long. Um, but he was from, he was from um, uh, Namibia which used to be Southwest Africa, when, when, um, when the government got returned uh, from the colonialist, in other words, the, uh, you know, back to the people, they renamed the country from Southwest Africa to Namibia, which was its original name. And uh, he was here, and he said, I just came from a, a church up in, in Virginia. He said, I was there last night, you know, and the night before. He said, the night before, that woman from Brazil, who's now dead, by the way, that had gold dust. She would speak, and people go, supposedly gold dust would appear on people's Bible pages. Just a little bit, just a little bit. And, uh, all, and people would just, she said the place held like, uh, oh, maybe two, 3,000 people. It was packed full. Yeah. Then she took up a huge offering. Now, if you can get gold dust, why do you need to take up an offering? Just everybody bring the Bible up and dump it into the site and give it back to you. I'm serious. If you can preach and get gold dust to appear all over the place, just everybody bring the Bibles up and dump that, and that's your offer, and go home with it. That went over big. So the next night, there was this young man, and he said she didn't preach anything that was, that was of any worth. Nothing that helped. So the next night, there was a young preacher up there. If they preached like crazy, there were 80 people in the building. Go see, the, 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 the hook carrot of getting some kind of crazy supernatural rich all of a sudden was gone. See? So, so Paul dealt with the people who were had lack not to pursue being rich. In other words, don't make that your goal. Do the, the, if you follow the Bible, you'll, go, you'll get there. You'll get to the place of prosperity. You'll get to the place of abundance. And you'll, and you'll do it right you have the right attitudes. Your heart will be right toward God. Your heart will be right toward men. You'll be a blessing to the kingdom. Amen. And then he comes back here and talks to people who are already rich. And you keep your heart right too, pal. You don't get to just run things just because you got money. As a matter of fact, you need to be ready to distribute. You need to be ready to communicate your finances. Amen. You need to be doing good works. And you need to lay up your treasure and store in heaven, not just here on the earth. Verse 20. Oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to that trust. Avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science so falsely called, um, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. And then he finishes that with this, grace be unto thee, amen. We trust that you were blessed by the word of God and the flow of the spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.